I'm sorry you had to see my New Year's resolution list like that, but uh, how many of you can identify with that as you make your resolutions for the new year? I think this is an interesting time of the year because people are looking back at the past year and they're evaluating what they've done and looking forward to the new year, and they begin to make resolutions about um, what they'll do in the coming year. And, and I think that's interesting. Maybe you have a, a tradition for making resolutions for, for yourself. Maybe your family or friends have some kind of tradition, you, a way that you keep each other accountable. Or maybe your resolutions are like mine and you have to scratch them out and edit them at the end of the year. But what if instead of making resolutions, we just determined to have resolve instead? You know, I think the problem with resolutions is that too often the resolutions are shaped by our culture. What do I mean by that? Well, let me suggest that most of the resolutions that we make are man-centered. And maybe more importantly, they're me-centered. They're all centered around us and what we do and how we'll be better in the next year. And they're fixated on what is temporary and not what is eternal. Just the next year, in the next two years, my five-year goals. Well, I'm not suggesting that you do away with these resolutions, but maybe in the coming year, we look at having resolve, and instead of focusing on me and mine, that we would make resolutions that are God-centered instead of me-centered that are God-sized instead of me-sized. I think that when we do that, we're going to discover the resolve of the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. And we're promised that God, when we ask things according to his will, he'll do that. So if we make our resolve according to his will, we'll be successful in the coming year. In Acts chapter 4, which is our text for today, we find Peter and John outside the temple. They're preaching to the people. And I think in this text, you're going to find out the real meaning of resolve. But let me set the scene for you, or as Mike likes, like to, likes to say, let me set the context for you. What is happening coming into this preaching that Peter and John are doing? Well, if you remember, in Acts chapter 1 is where we find the ascension of Jesus. Jesus has just left and promised the disciples the indwelling Holy Spirit. They, they waited for, for that, and in the upper room, we find that the Holy Spirit comes upon them and now dwells inside them. In Acts chapter 2 is where you find the story of the Pentecost where the disciples are in the upper room. And then Acts chapter 2 is also right immediately behind that is where you find Peter's powerful sermon that he preaches to the people and over 3,000 come to Christ and begin to be part of the church, what we call the New Testament church. It's begun to spread rapidly as the gospel is being preached and in chapter 3, we begin our story for today. Peter and John are heading into the temple. And a, a lame man at the gate who's been begging each day, he says to them coming in, he's asking for money from them as they come in. And here's what Peter says to the lame man. In, in chapter 3, verse 6, we, we read, Peter said, I do not possess silver or gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, walk. And so the lame man is so overjoyed by, by getting to walk that he begins to, to walk along aside Peter and John. He just won't leave their side. And as they walk into the temple area, the, the porch that's surrounding the temple, they're, they're in there, and all of a sudden a crowd begins to gather. And the people are saying, you know, what, what happened how did this happen? Who are these men? What, what power do they have? Are there any other miracles they're going to do? All of the questions and the, the people begin to gather. Maybe some people are just there because they don't want to miss the show. In case something else happens that's exciting, 
They want to be there. And Peter and John, as they relay to the people, they say, look, the power to heal is not within us. It's the, by the name of Jesus, that powerful name that we sp spoke about this morning in song. I want you to see their response to the people as the people push into them and begin to question what's going on, who are these people. Here's what we find in Acts chapter 3, verses 12 through 16. But when Peter saw this, he replied to the people, Men of Israel, why are you amazed at this? Or why do you gaze at us as if by our own power or piety we had made him walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus, the one whom you delivered and disowned in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you disowned the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. But put to death the prince of life, the one whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are witnesses. And on the basis of faith in his name, it is the name of Jesus which has strengthened this man, whom you see and know, and the faith which comes through him who has given him this perfect health in the presence of you all. Look, they say, look. The, the, the power to heal doesn't, doesn't come from us. It comes from the name of Jesus. And they begin to press the people, but look at what they do. They don't begin to say, oh, you can have this, this wonderful power that we have. No, they begin to charge the people. It was because of you that Jesus suffered on a cross and was murdered. He died. It's your fault. It's our fault. You know, here's the thing. We weren't there in history to press to have Jesus killed, but our sins were. Our sins were the reason that Jesus was pushed to the cross. And so we bear that, that guilt and shame as well. And so when Peter and John are saying to them, look, it was you that pushed them, that message is to us today too. Your sins pushed him to the cross. Now, this is not the most politically correct message. They're, they're telling, it's your fault, now repent. Turn away from that and receive salvation. Too often we try to make the gospel this, this nice little package. It's neat and nice, but they're boldly talking to people, telling them, look, the good news of God's grace is only good because the bad news was so bad. Because you are so guilty, because your sins are so wretched and so vile, and because you have put him to death, he went to death on the cross. And now the good news, he's been raised, and his salvation is for you. Repent and turn to him. Hebrews 9.22 reminds us of this fact. According to the law, one may also say, all things are cleansed with blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. There's no remission of sin. So this is the context leading up to our text today in Acts chapter 4 as we find Peter and John going into the temple. So let's read the text, Acts chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. If you'll read with me from God's word. And as they were speaking to the temple, or speaking to the people, the priest and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. So here we find them preaching the message. It's all about Jesus. I want you to see there are two things that are happening in the text here. Here's the first thing. The first thing is that the gospel is met with resistance. Note the rea reactions of the religious leaders here. They're, they're greatly annoyed, and then they come and they arrest them. They're not swayed by the message. In fact, they're not even listening. Their hearts are already hard to the message. The gospel here is met with a great resistance. Why did the religious leaders resist the message of Jesus? Because the message of Jesus was this, 
Something has to change. And what they saw in the message of Jesus was a revolution. And what they feared was that revolution would mean a disruption to their own comfort. They were interested in keeping the status quo. Their comfortable life needed to stay the way it was. It's not much different today. The reason the gospel is so attacked is because the gospel threatens that comfortable way of life. Listen, my life would be much more comfortable without the gospel. I could take care of me and mine, and I wouldn't have to worry about anyone else. It disrupts our comfort. It disrupts our feelings of shame and and brings that guilt that can only be relieved by the blood of Jesus Christ. It's a heart issue. There are two types of resistance that you see here. The first is spiritual. It's spiritual in nature. You see, it's, it's important that every time that you understand that every time you preach the gospel, there will be spiritual resistance to the gospel. Even in people whose hearts will be changed by the gospel, there will be initial spiritual resistance to the gospel. Why, why do I say that? I think because sometimes we believe, well, just sharing the gospel is an easy thing. And it is in one way. It's easy in the fact that it's not hard to, to actually say the gospel, to, to present that. But it's not easy in another way because there's a battle that's raging on for the souls of men. See, I don't know that we always take and understand that well. There is a battle raging for the souls of men. And Satan will do everything he can who has control over those who are controlled by sin. He will do everything he can to influence them away from the gospel. He'll distract them. Let me tell you, we say this a lot in church life, but the devil is in electronics. Why? Because the gospel is preached through them. If you've been in any services for very long, listen, I I remember being here uh, earlier here at Central, and I remember one morning showing up, and the lights, we had a problem with the lights. Now, lights are kind of important. If you're going to meet, you've got to be able to read your your Bible, and the lights wouldn't work. We went up, we did some figuring, and what we figured out is we could pull the panel out and push it back in, and the lights would come back on. We did that for several weeks as we tried to figure out a plan for making the lights work right. Why did that happen? Why does it happen that Mike will be on his mic and in a perfect point in his message, all of a sudden his mic begins to pop? You don't think that Satan's in a battle? There's a spiritual battle that's raging for the souls of men, and so we need to make sure we prepare for that as we share the gospel. Scripture reminds us our battle's not against flesh and blood. It's against the powers. There are powers out there that are resisting us when we share the gospel. I love Paul's writing because Paul was either an athlete or a fan of athletes. And Paul talks about standing firm. And and in sports, we have something called an athletic stance. In basketball, it's much like this. It's a balanced stance. And the reason we're balanced is we need to be able to be be able to react and respond to whatever the defense or offense is doing, depending on what you're on. It's a preparation. No one would go in to, to a basketball game and stand just like this. It's not a good stance. I mean, it looks really cool right now. You know, it looks like touchdown maybe, but this wrong sport. No, we get an athletic stance. We're ready to move, to respond to what's going on. And so when we share the gospel, we need to be ready, prepared. We need to be able to, what I say, we need to be prepared to respond rather than react. What's the difference? Well, reaction is determined by what others do. A response is a planned action, depending on what others do. And so we need to plan when we share the gospel, knowing that there is going to be a spiritual resistance. But notice that it doesn't stop there. There's a second kind of resistance that happens here. It's physical. Now, this is one that we ignore a lot because in our culture, we don't face this. We share the gospel, and we have the freedom to share the gospel, and people sometimes don't like it, and they say mean things about us. 
but it usually ends there. There are usually not physical confrontations for us to face. We don't have to face being jailed. But it's not true around the, around the world. In fact, the fastest growing, fastest growing church in the world is a church that's persecuted. All over the world, the, the persecuted church, those places that they have to risk their own safety, the safety of their family to share the gospel, the church is growing. They understand that. They've got the fact that it's a, a spiritual battle and they see the battle raging because it's physical as well. Well, there's a physical threat and the disciples, they're arrested and they're taken in they throw them in jail overnight and they say, we'll figure out what to do with them later. I told you there are two things that happened in the passage. The first was that the gospel was met with resistance, but the second is that the gospel is met with belief. For the people that believed that day, the evidence had continued to mount, uh, mount for them and they were finally convinced that what the disciples had to say was true. They'd seen all the evidence but I want you to see something really amazing. These people trusted in Jesus, and yet there was no formal invitation. In fact, the disciples are speaking, and they get arrested and taken away. And the people standing there said, you know what, we believe. No formal invitation was given. The gospel had penetrated their hearts. They repented. They trusted in Jesus the service got interrupted, but the invitation was still there. It didn't have to be a formal invitation. The truth, the truth is, if you're here and God begins to speak to you and you don't respond during a formal invitation, it's not over. God can save you in your home. He can save you in your car. He can save you at your workplace, at your school. So don't believe you walk out, you don't have another shot, but also don't wait. I want you to think with me how amazing this is. We, we would be astounded at this. It says the number in the text, 5,000 men come to Christ. Now, I had glossed over this. I honestly had missed this many times reading this passage because the great number is earlier, right? The 3,000 men had come to Christ during Peter's first sermon. Well, as you know, we get better with our sermons, so Peter was better the second time around. So now it's 5,000 instead of three. 5,000 men came to Christ. Now think about what that means in the context of what this means, or how, the context of all this. The people are standing around in the temple area. The religious leaders just come and arrest Peter and John and are taking them away. You see a pattern that might be happening? And if I'm one of them, I'm thinking, you know what? They crucified Jesus. That was the first start. They arrested him, then they tortured him, and they put him to death, and now they're taking his followers. If I become one of them, the same thing is going to happen to me. But the power of the gospel overwhelmed all of that fear. Perfect love cast out fear, right? And they trusted Jesus, willing to give up all comfort for the gospel. And see... That was even despite the fact that persecution could be coming. Despite the fact that that was maybe in their future, they were willing to give up everything for the gospel. Many believed the word. I think that's a note of comfort for us as believers as we share the gospel because sometimes we share the gospel and no one believes. It's just written in there to remind us, but some, they did. Because we had the religious leaders whose, heart, whose hearts were hard and they didn't believe and they shared the gospel and they had wanted nothing to do with that. But some believed. So don't stop sharing because someone doesn't believe. Keep sharing because some believe. In this case, 5,000. Many will believe. Let's continue the story. Acts chapter 4, or four, starting in verse 5. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had all set them in their midst, they inquired, by what power or what name do you, did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, 
If we're being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they had saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another saying, what shall we do with these men? For a notable sign has been performed through them and is evident to all inhabitants of Jerusalem. And we cannot deny it, but in order that it may not spread, that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threaten them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of all the people, for all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. This is the climax of the story here. The men are brought before the religious leaders, and I want you to see that there is a call for resolution here. There is a call for how their determination is going to be set. This is the true test. They're arrested. They may think there's no chance of escape now. They may say, here we go again. Same thing that happened to Jesus is happening to us. But Peter and John, they're ready. There's no discussion really about what they're thinking, but they've had time to process this. They're ready. If it's time for us because we share the name of Jesus, praise the Lord. And so here, what do they do? They give their testimony. Look, all of their testimony is placed on Jesus. The whole message, it revolves around and is tied to the name of Jesus. They're basically saying, look, we are of no consequence. We don't really matter. Our bodies don't matter. What you do to us doesn't matter because the name of Jesus is the name by which this happened. He has the real power over sin and death. He's the Messiah. He's the one that can give you life. Their resolve didn't change because of their circumstances. But also they didn't say, hey, uh, look, we're going to be talking to these people that are going to be angry with us, and so we're going to change the message a little bit to make it sound better and maybe make them not feel so uncomfortable, so maybe we'll get out of here. No political correctness here. No, you guys are the ones who put him to death, and this is the Jesus that we're talking about. Remains the same, their testimony you know, a lot of times our testimony, we talk about our testimony, what, you know, God has done to change us. That's not really the true testimony, is it? The true testimony is what has Jesus done? What, what has Jesus done? We're, we're really of no consequence, the fact that we change or don't change. I mean, we're imperfect, and sometimes we don't look like we've changed much. But Jesus, he died for us. He rose three days later and he sits at the right hand of God the Father and he's interceding and he, he offers us salvation, eternal life through him. That's the testimony that we want to give. It's centered around Jesus, not around me. So let me tell you this. Kobe and I were talking about this the other day. We were talking about there was a time in the church in which the greatest testimonies were these testimonies of the person who started dealing drugs when they were four years old and they were hooked on heroin in the middle of a ditch when God finally saved them. Let me say, that's a great testimony if that's you. 
But the greatest testimony is that God saves you. That's it. So we all have that great testimony of Jesus who saves us out of our sin. We were all responsible, and we all have to face the consequences, and Jesus saves. And here, again, they're accepting a punishment. The religious leaders at this point, they're not sure what to do with them, so they, they get together and they say, we'll tell them we're going to punish them if they do it again. Now, Peter and John don't know this. So when you read the text, you think, well, see, Peter and John, they got away free. Peter and John don't know that. In fact, they assume that what they're going to face is probably some lashes at least. And so they're ready. In fact, I would say they're probably shocked when they get released. You know, that they actually, they let us go. They really tell them, look, I, I want you to go out and, and don't preach anymore. They're hoping maybe they'll, they'll leave and maybe go to a more secluded spot and maybe there won't be as many people, there won't be as much influence. Here's what they do. They throw it right back at them. They say, look, here's what you've got to decide. Verse 18 or Verse 19, Peter and John answered them, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you judge. Hey, you figure it out. I think the answer is really a rhetorical question. Who should we actually follow, you or God? Nope, we're going to follow God. Here's what they basically say. Look, you guys can let us go. We're going out and we're doing the same thing. We're probably going to go to the same place that we were just at. We're going to say the same things, and we hope another 5,000 come to Christ. So you can do whatever you want, but we're going right back to do what we're going to do. Now, if you say that, and I'm the one in charge, I'm going back and conferring. Hold them just a second. We're going to re-decide because we're going to do something different. So Peter and John, they don't know that they're going to be released. And they say, look, you can release us. We're going right back to what we're doing. Because this is what God has called us to do. This is so, so important. They had this resolve that I'm talking about. They resolved to pray, proclaim Christ regardless of what happened. It was a settled thing. It never had to be re revisited every year. They didn't have to put that on their list every year. They didn't have to say, well, this year I resolve to proclaim the name of Christ. That was an assumed thing. And let me just suggest to you, if you need to put it on your list, put it on your list. But it should be an assumed thing that if you are a believer in Jesus, that you resolve to share the name of Jesus. It should be settled and it may disrupt your comfort if you have family members like we have some family members that don't believe in Jesus, it's going to be uncomfortable sharing the, the name of Jesus with them. But it's going to have real eternal significance. They knew through their experience that following Jesus brought real power. And so they were resolved to follow him regardless. They had the Holy Spirit living inside them. What else do you need? We've been given every spiritual gift that we'll ever need. It's right there. In fact, if you read the, le if you read the last part of chapter 4, and I encourage you to, it says that they basically go back and all their friends are amazed that they're released, and they say, let's get on our knees and pray that we have the same boldness tomorrow to do the same thing again because they knew they're, they're weak and tempted to not have that resolve. So what are the challenges for us today? What are your takeaways that we'll be able to apply to the next year? First, I want you to resolve to make his name great and not your own. Just make that, that, that one of your, your first resolutions or just make that a part of your everyday life. I resolve Jesus to make your name great and not my own. I really don't care about my name. I want to make your name great. 
Look, I don't care if you see anything great about Tom Myers. I hope you see something great about Jesus. Because Tom Myers is nothing, but Jesus is great. You don't come to Tom Myers for salvation. You come to Jesus for salvation. And so proclaim and make his name great and not your own. You let him make his name great through you. Instead of maybe your resolutions have been centered around some personal gain or satisfaction, maybe you change your resolution this way. Look, that promotion that I really wanted, I, I want to earn that promotion. And here's why I want to earn the promotion. Because I want a greater platform to share the name of Jesus. That's a resolution worth living for. And second, I want you to create temporal resolutions that have an eye to the eternal. When you create your resolutions, don't just think about what will happen in the coming year, but think about how those decisions will affect the eternal. Well, it may be that you need to lose the 20 pounds, but maybe the reason that you need to lose the 20 pounds is so that your body will have enough stamina for you to do the work that God is calling you to do as you go share his name. Now, that's a reason to lose 20 pounds. And that's one that God can get behind. God, I need the stamina. I need my body to be ready to go where you're calling me to go. Or maybe it's, I need to read my Bible. But the reason that you need to read your Bible is so that you can be prepared to make defense for the gospel to those friends who are asking questions. God, I need to know more about your word because people are asking and I don't have the answers and I want to have the answers. I want them to come back to my mind. Or, or maybe it's, hey, I need to organize my life so I have more time to serve Jesus. Hey, look, my life is so cluttered, I need to get some things out of it. And the reason I need to get the things out of it, the reason I need to organize that is so that no longer becomes a hindrance to me serving Jesus. I've got it ready to go. We're at the time of response this morning, and you may be going, I have no idea how I would respond to that, me either. Um, but let me give you some suggestions. Some of you may need to just come and pray this morning and say, look, God, I know that I haven't made resolutions like this in the past. I'm making something different this year. I'm going to determine to have resolve, not in my own power, but in your power given through the Holy Spirit. I'm going to get out of the Holy Spirit's way and let that resolve take over. And then I'm going to start writing resolutions that have an eye for the eternal. So maybe you just need to come down and say, look, I've been doing it wrong, Jesus. I need your help to do it right as I prepare for the year ahead. I need to boast in Christ and in him crucified. Or maybe you've been visiting a church and you've been looking around for a church that will meet your needs. Let me tell you, this isn't it. We can't meet your needs. We're fallen and broken. But what we can, what we can offer you is what Jesus offers you, grace. And second of all, a place for you to serve. Because look, you shouldn't be coming to the church for us to meet your needs. You should be coming to the church to serve the church. And Jesus Christ. So if that's you and you've been looking around for a church that's going to meet your needs, maybe it's time for you to look for a church that you can serve in. And that may not be central. It may be somewhere else. We really don't care. But you need to be serving in a place, in a local congregation, serving Jesus through the church, his bride. Maybe you're here today and you heard the gospel for the first time and you're like, oh, man, I, I don't know if I really understand Listen, the gospel, in case you missed it, is this simple. I'm going to read it so I don't mess it up. We have a creator. He's established standards by which we should live, and we've broken those standards. That's what we refer to as sin. The Bible tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That means that no one of us has lived up to that standard. The Bible also tells us that as a result of our sin, our not living by that standard earns us a punishment which is both physical and spiritual. It's death. And when we come to the end of our life, God will judge us 
because of our sin and we deserve punishment in an eternal place called hell. If that was the end, we wouldn't have anything to be celebrating this morning. But there's good news. The Bible continues to say that the free gift of God is eternal life in, in Christ. Jesus, God's son, came and lived a perfect life. He met that perfect standard. He died and was raised three days later and now sits at the right hand of the Father. He took our place. If we accept that gift of his, free gift of his son, and choose to follow him, we have eternal life. That's it. That may be you this morning. You say, for the first time I heard it and I understood it, and I need to respond to Jesus. You come. I'm going to pray, and as musicians move their way forward for our invitation, when our invitation comes, you stand and come. Kneel at the altar. Make your, make your resolutions this next year. Come respond to how God is calling. Let's pray.